Ready? Ready? All right. I call the St. Paul City Council to order. Roll call. Tolbert? Here. Yang? Here. Ballinger? Here. Jalali? Here. Naker? Prince? Here. Council President Bredmon? Here. Six present, one absent, being Council Member Naker, who is excused. If you would like, please stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Consent agenda items 2 through 19 are before you for your consideration. No, item number 17 is being withdrawn. Is there anything else that should be taken separately this afternoon from consent? All right, seeing none, Ms. Jalali moves approval. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion prevails. Six in favor, no one opposed. The consent agenda is adopted as amended. <clears throat> Item 20 is resolution 22-851, authorizing the conveyance of 38 city-owned properties to the St. Paul Public School District. All right, and on this item, we just asked for a very brief staff report from um, our real estate department and Bruce Engelbrecht. Council President Bryn Moen and council members, uh, thanks for the time to say a couple of words about this. Um, this item is a follow-up to a resolution adopted by the city council on February 23rd, and it authorized the city's transfer of properties to the St. Paul Public School District. Today's resolution authorizes the transfer of an additional 38 properties. The reason for this requested authorization goes back to 1965, when the state legislature created the Independent School District 625. Up to that time, the city's public schools were operated by the special school district of the city of St. Paul, and all land and improvements were owned by the city. The 1965 law required that all city school property be transferred to the new school district. These requested conveyances now are intended to confirm and provide recorded evidence of the statutory transfer of title. Um, I can provide more background if you'd like on this, uh, just as to what we're, what, what we're looking at now. What we've done so far is conveyed uh, six properties, or we have done that with council authorization. These 38 are also properties that are not controversial. They are completely operated and managed by the school district. There are seven additional properties where there is kind of a joint city um, and school district use. There's either a school with a rec center attached or there's some green space, ball fields next to a school. There's even some land where there is land that is owned by the city underneath a school building. And so those we've talked to the parks department about and we need to have further conversation with the school district. It may mean that we don't convey those at all or that we would do some kind of a land swap to kind of clean up title given the uses on the property. So that will be a little bit longer, but um, today's action are, are all, is all related to properties that are exclusively used and operated by the school district. Great, thank you, and I appreciate your coming in to explain that to us. I, it sounds sure. like we're just tidying up. I know um, looking at the North End Community Center project, that was a, an example where we pulled up the um, who owns what parcels of land, and it was uh, almost like a little braid of um, school and um, city properties. And so um, getting these tidied up would also have expedited that um, the planning process there. So I appreciate that. Just when you look at the item on the agenda that says conveying 38 city-owned properties to the school district, you have some questions. So I appreciate your coming in. Do, and does anyone have questions for Mr. Engelbrecht? All right. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you. All right. Didn't see there's none, no discussion. Mr. Tolbert moves approval. Uh, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion prevails. Six in favor. No one opposed. The resolution is adopted. Item 21 is Resolution 22-1555, recognizing the second Monday in October as Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, Council Member Prince. Thank you. Thank you both. I, I'll read the resolution and then I'd love it if you would um, say a few words. Recognizing the second Monday in October 
as Indigenous Peoples Day. Whereas we recognize that the city of St. Paul is on Dakota land and is known to Dakota people by the name Imniza Ska, which means White Bluffs, and whereas the recognition of Indigenous Peoples Day was first proposed in 1977 by a delegation of Native Nations to the United Nations sponsored International Conference on Discrimination Against Indigenous Populations in the Americas. And whereas to reveal a more accurate historical record of the United States of America, representatives from 120 Indigenous nations at the First Continental Conference on 500 years of Indian resistance unanimously passed a resolution in 1977 to transform Columbus Day into an occasion to recognize the contribution of indigenous peoples. And whereas the city of St. Paul supports the American Indian community, honors its culture and traditions and its many contributions, and has recognized Indigenous Peoples Day since 2015. And whereas this year's Indigenous Peoples Day activities in St. Paul include a march from Margaret Park to Indian Mounds Regional Park and a celebration to follow there afterwards. And whereas a groundbreaking ceremony was held on August 29th, 2022, which brings us a step closer to the highly anticipated opening of the Wakan Teepee Center, a Dakota-led project in the heart of Dakota homelands that in partnership with the City of St. Paul Parks and Recreation Department is creating a cultural center at the Bruce Bento Nature Sanctuary to help interpret this sacred site. And whereas this project aspires to provide a place for reverence, remembrance and healing in a way that protects, honors, and recognizes the sacredness of the location. Therefore, be it resolved in recognition that St. Paul acknowledges the importance of the Dakota sacred places that exist in current city parks. St. Paul is committed to working with tribal partners to develop and implement appropriate cultural resource management plans for these sites that honor and defend the sacred and address tribal access for indigenous ceremonies or events held on city park land. And be it further resolved that the city of St. Paul recognizes October 10th, 2022 as Indigenous Peoples Day. And first I'll introduce Strong Buffalo, Tom LeBlanc. No, I wanted to clap too, can we? <laughs> Well, on behalf of all Dakota, from the very beginning to now, and those that would follow us, we're uh, happy that St. Paul is acknowledging this day is uh, for the indigenous people. Thank you very much. Ah, Buju, John Bobalink, Indigenous Cars, Gazaga Squad, Jim Acog, and Dunjaba, Mayangan, and Dodame. I don't want to add any more to uh, what Tom has already said, speaking for Dakota. I'm a Ojibwe man living here uh, in the metro area, working in St. Paul. I just want to say, and what I can add to that is that I have uh, uh, in my life seen uh, great change where I have not recognized uh, American Indian representation anywhere or definitely not the schools or our governments. But uh, I am beginning to see that change. I'm seeing that here uh, with your work and this proclamation. So I thank you for all you're doing and encourage you to continue on. Miigwech. All right, so Ms. Prince, we should make this official with a motion on this um, resolution. Does anyone have discussion on the motion to approve? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion prevails. Six in favor, no one opposed. The resolution is adopted. 
Item 22 is Resolution 22-1558, honoring the legacy of lifelong St. Paul resident Barbara Statton upon her retirement. Ms. Prince. Thank you. Um, last week I was invited on behalf of the City of St. Paul City Council to honor Barbara Satin, um, a transgender activist who has worked on issues of aging, faith, gender justice, and who is retiring from a long and successful career in advocacy um, as the Faith Work Director at the National LGBTQ Task Force, um, where her responsibilities included working for full inclusion of trans persons in communities. Barbara has been a housing activist um, who worked for the development of Spirit on Lake, an affordable LGBTQ senior housing project, and only the second such project in the United States in early and pioneering development in the growing field of advocacy for creating housing for LGBTQ elders. Barbara has been um, called on by the White House on several occasions. She was invited by President Obama to, um, to the first, she was the first of um, three LGBTQ people invited to participate in the White House Conference on Aging and in 2016 was appointed by President Obama to the Presidential Council on Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. And in 21, she was the prayer leader for President Biden's inaugural breakfast. But what makes Barbara really significant to us in St. Paul is that um, back in the 80s and 90s, um, at, at the start, as a senior corporate ex public, senior corporate public affairs executive with the St. Paul companies, um, was among the most active and effective community leaders in St. Paul at that time, providing unparalleled leadership on several City of St. Paul boards and commissions, where she initiated innovative practices that empowered neighbors as partners in community development. Um, most notably, she served for over a decade as chair of St. Paul's Capital Improvement Budget Commission, transforming its operation and personally reaching out to all district councils to ensure their participation in direct funding and establishing the city's community development priorities and then also served as a member of the St. Paul Planning Commission where she combined her capital improvement budgeting know-how with the city's long-range planning to establish a process for phasing development and sequencing the city's financial investments leading to a more strategic and efficient use of resources. So just a truly remarkable person and a resident of Ward 3, lifelong resident of Ward 3. Um, so this is a, a very special opportunity to um, recognize a St. Paul resident who has made just incredible contributions to our city and to um, the nation as a whole. So with that, I move, she w was planning to be here today. I was waiting for that part. Yeah, and could not make it, so. Um, I um, move approval of this, of this, of honoring this great woman with this resolution. Wonderful. Um, so is there any discussion on the motion from Ms. Prince? And it is too bad that she wasn't able to join us today. Hopefully she'll watch the recap later and um, maybe you can present it in person as well. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion prevails. Six in favor, no one opposed. The resolution is adopted. Item 23 is ABZA 22-2, considering the appeal of Friends of Pig's Eye Lake Park, Tom Diamond, to a decision of the Board of Zoning Appeals denying a request to issue a stop work order on the Pig's Eye Lake Island building project, a project regulated and permitted by the Department of Natural Resources. And I believe uh, we have David Ide here uh, to give us a staff oh, report. There's someone else, I guess. Oh, wrong. 
Council President Brenda Moan, um, Council Members. I'm Andrew Hogg. I'm the Water Resource Coordinator. I'll be speaking on David's behalf for DSI. Okay, sorry uh, about that. That's we all right. It's going to be David. All right. Um, Pig's Eye Lake Project is a project being conducted by the Army Corps of Engineers, with their sponsor being Ramsey County. Um, the objectives of the project is uh, aquatic habitat, bird habitat, and to prevent erosion on Pig's Eye Lake. Um, in 2015, um, the Corps and Ramsey County went through an, a feasibility study, which included assessments of several options. Um, and during this feasibility study, they also went through various um, environmental reviews. Um, re um, they went through the environmental assessment review for the Environmental Quality Board of Minnesota, and they went through the National Environment Act policy review. So they did go through several reviews. Um, they bid the project. Um, they also received grant funding from the Lassard Sam Outdoor Heritage um, pot of money, and um, the project was granted a DNR work in the waters permit in 2020, August of 2020. COVID happened, um, so the project was delayed a bit. This year, the project started up, ponds started going in, um, and we got a complaint from Mr. Diamond saying that um, there were no permits by the city and that the city should issue a stop work order. Um, the city reviewed the complaint. Um, the city's determination is that it is below the ordinary high water level, which is the jurisdictional line for public body, bodies of water. Above that line, the city has some jurisdiction. Below that water, it's a public body of water jurisdictional duties belong to the DNR. Um, he appealed um, it, at the BZA meeting. The board members had some questions. Um, they asked three questions to the DNR. The DNR responded, and they got that memo. Um, they discussed it. Um, it was held once or twice, um, and they came to a decision to deny the appeal. Um, I'm available for other questions. We do have um, the author of the notices or the letters from the DNR on hand. Should you have questions for the DNR, Dan Scallion is also here. All right, so if there's questions, <coughs> there are staff available to answer mm -hmm. them, um, if you can. Okay, great, are there questions? Ms. Prince. Yeah, um, and I think this is a DNR question. This is, a, this is probably one of the most complex appeal records I've ever seen, so um, I, I really appreciate your work, Andrew. Um, and my question is, um, it looks like the, has the DNR delineated what the um, overall, what is it, the OLW or OHWL? Yes, correct, the ordinary high water level. Yep, mm -hmm. that's the jurisdictional boundary. Um, when they last did it, I do not know that would be a question for the yeah. DNR. Okay, then. This is Dan Scallion, the area hydrologist. Welcome. Welcome, yeah. Uh, I'm Dan Scallion. I'm the East Metro Area Hydrologist for the Minnesota DNR, so that includes Ramsey and Washington counties. Um, so, you know, my role is permitting work in public waters projects, as well as I assist communities on um, our land use programs, for example, floodplain. Um, protection programs, as well as the Mississippi River Critical Corridor Area Program. Um, so regarding your question, uh, so the Mississippi for Pig's Eye Lake, um, you have to, when we think about Pig's Eye Lake, it is a part of the Mississippi River system. It's a big river system, so you have, and you have multiple channels, you have backwater areas. Pig's Eye Lake is one of those backwater areas. So we use ordinary high water levels. Um, this, we've used this process for nearly 20 years, same set of numbers. Um, we use them from the Coon Rapids Dam down to the Iowa border. Um, they are different values based on their um, location along the river. Obviously, there's a slope in the river. Um, they correspond to what we would consider an ordinary high level, which is a two-year flood elevation, which is a typical um, elevation involved in um, river bank formation. Obviously, we have a regulated river on the Mississippi River, but those dams operate in a different way than, say, the reservoir dams that you see in the upper Mississippi headwaters. 
they are designed to maintain the nine foot navigation channel. So basically what they do is they keep the water level from getting as low as it used to go. Um, if you, you know, in the middle of August, um, if you look at old pictures of Pig's Eye Lake, you would have seen a lot of marsh habitat. You would have seen a lot of emergent vegetation. And because of the way the dam operates, the water level doesn't get as low as it used to. So part of this project is really addressing the loss of vegetation. Um, and because of those sustained habitat, we have mucky sediments. The, the, the sediment, in the, sediment on the bottom of the lake doesn't have an opportunity to regularly dry out, consolidate. So we have more turbid water, less vegetation establishment. This project addresses that problem. Um, as far as the ordinary high water level, you can delineate our line for the Mississippi River, and it completely includes Pig's Eye Lake. So, and it, as far as you might ask, is our ordinary high water level too high? It is certainly higher than the water level that's out there now. But what I would point out to you, that is actually 13 feet below the 100-year flood elevation. It is not an extreme number. Um, Hopefully that answers your question. I think it does. And I, I do have another question. Um, and thank you. I, I think I understand that. Um, but one of the other questions I had is, and I haven't been down there to, to see how the work is progressing, but I, people have sent photos. And, um, and so there's work going on Along, I mean, I'm not talking about work in the water or if there's the pipeline or whatever that's putting the the fill into the water, but but there is work going on around the edges of the lake. So my understanding, they're accessing the site from the Red Rock Terminal, which is operated by the St. Paul Port Authority. Yeah. So that is the access point. Um, you know that. The Red Rock River Terminal is, is managed for barging traffic and is dredged, and so that can, is used as the access point. So, so is, there, is there dirt being moved around down there and fill and other stuff that would normally require a permit? There is fill being placed. It is, it is dredged material. Um, it is, you know, the, Federal law allowed the Corps to pursue with local partners beneficial uses of dredge material. Um, and these are, there's a number, there's many other projects like this out there which are attempting to, again, reestablish some of that habitat that has been right. lost. Yeah. Um, the, the fill is being placed. These are essentially, you can call them islands they will be visible during low water levels during the summer. Um, but they're being constructed to an elevation where they'll be regularly inundated mm -hmm. and well below um, you know, established flood elevations. They're there to support you know, aquatic and wetland vegetation. Right, right. and I, I'm aware of the project and, and what it's meant to do. I guess the, the question I'm asking is that it seems like one of the original questions that came to Mr. Hogg, and maybe this is a question for both of you, is that even though this is being done as a DNR, it, under the jurisdiction of the DNR mm -hmm. um, with the Army Corps of Engineers in Ramsey County and so forth, um, normally when you would be working on a project wouldn't you still be required to get the permits that are required locally? You know, I, I mean, the, the, the probably stupid example that I thought of was, you know, when, the, when the, the state of Minnesota decided to build the Senate office building on land that was part of the state campus, mm -hmm. it needed to get city permits to do that. So that, I mean... Were there no underlying permits just to do work in the city that should have been sought, one being the, the critical area permit and then the other one being 
whatever a building permit would be when you're going to be moving a bunch of dirt around. Right. So again, my understanding, and if you look at, for example, the Mississippi River Critical Corridor area rules, um, there is a rule specifically, and I can give you the part, the, the exact number. Um, it's uh, 6106.0110. It, it states that dredging and the placement of dredged material are subject to existing federal and state permit requirements and agreements. Um, and you know, my understanding generally when there are projects, um, you know, in most communities and throughout the state, you know, the communities, the local governments, the cities and counties are dealing with development on land. Right. And then the, the DNR, um, we have basically a, we, the state does have shoreland programs like the Mississippi River Critical Corridor Area Program where the DNR establishes rules and we work with the local governments on development on kind of a strip of land around those public waters. But in general, you know, this is development within the water and that is where, you know, DNR issues the permits. And, and it's not that, you know, the state, we are required to provide the application to the city of St. Paul, um, to any city that where a project is worked in. Um, cities can submit comments on the permit application, and cities also have the right to demand a contested case hearing before an, <clears throat> before an administrative law judge on any permit decision by the DNR. And if you could just give me that citation again. Oh, for the Mississippi River Critical Corridor area? Yeah, yeah that is, um, it's Minnesota Administrative Rules 6106.0110. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. I think that's it. Any other questions? All right, thanks a lot. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone here to speak to this item? Um, seeing none, Ms. It looks like you're passing out a packet of information. I just want to remind you the two minutes goes by really quick. So I appreciate you. that you've like pre uh, supplied us with materials as well. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I'll wait until I can that stuff out. Oops, I hand it to you though. So if you could just start by introducing yourself, let us know where you live, and then we'll start the timer. You have two minutes to share your perspective, and you've handed out supplemental materials. The main two uh, things I wanted to talk about is... Tom, some of us know you, but could you start by introducing yourself and letting us know where you live, and then do your testimony? Sure. But the Tom Diamond, uh, 2119 Skyway Drive. Um, I want to talk about the ordinary high water line and the uh, uh, issue of the pollution. Uh, the ordinary high water line, this is actually a pretty simple thing. Um, there's a lot of red herrings that are being thrown out to distract, but it's uh, simply the ordinary high water level is an elevation delineating the highest water level that has been maintained for a sufficient period of time to leave evidence upon the landscape, commonly the point where the natural vegetation changes from predominantly aquatic to predominantly terrestrial. So that's the line that, that uh, there are two exceptions to that rule, and this is really important. For water courses, which would be the river, the ordinary high water level is the elevation of the top bank of the channel. It's not a water level, it's a bank level. 
The other one is where the vegetation changed. They don't, they're entirely different things. Then for reservoirs, uh, the uh, reservoirs in Florida says the ordinary high water level is the operating ele elevation in the normal summer pool. Again, what's controlled by the, uh, uh, the dam, it has nothing to do with vegetation. So the three different ones work on entirely different principles. Uh, what uh, uh, happened here is, uh, and also that uh, the, the level is 686.8 feet, which is provided uh, by the Corps of Engineers and has been used. It says in uh, determining normal levels, and this is from the DNR, it says the normal water level is consistent with the ordinary high water level reservoirs and flowages is the highest normal summer pool elevation. Mr. So Diamond, you, your time is up. For the for your, for your testimony. Appellant? Oh, you're the appellant. So I'm sorry, continue. Okay. Thank you, appreciate it. But so it's not unusual. It says right in their documentation that it's not unusual that you would have the, the, the same uh, number. What, uh, what the letter from uh, uh, the DNR says, and it is not, uh, it is not backed up, Pig's Eye Lake is directly connected to the Mississippi River via channels at the Red Rock Barge Terminal and Hog Lake. Due to these hydraulic connections, the water level of Pig's Eye Lake directly fluctuates with the water level of the Mississippi River. So the ordinary high water level of Pig's Eye Lake has therefore been determined to be the same as the ordinary high water level of the Mississippi River. Can't be, because it's the bank of the river that is the factor that decides uh, the river there. It is the elevation of the, that the Corps holds at the dam that matters here. If it weren't the dam that was controlled, it would be the vegetation change would be the determination. They're not the same factors. It's embarrassing that the DNR would send a letter out like this. Uh, I have talked to uh, the, uh, DNR, other DNR officials in the department, and they said that the Pig's Eye Lake has never been delineated for the ordinary high water level and went through the, that there is no documentation of setting an ordinary high water level by the DNR. So what we really need is delineation of this. Uh, uh, uh. So the, the next thing it says uh, it, in here is that in commercially, that in commercially nav navigable portions of the water, since 2005, the DNR has used top of bank elevation determined through hydrologic, uh, hydraulic modeling of the two-year uh, program of 50 uh, or 50% annual exceedance flow. When you get through all that uh, gobbledygook, what it says is they've set up a plan to figure out the uh, uh, bank of the river. This is the river. If you look at the document that was done with this, the memorandum of understanding, it says very specifically, it doesn't apply to uh, Big Side Lake, it only applies to the channel, the navigational channel in the Mississippi River, Minnesota River, and St. Croix River. That's the only place that agreement is. So to say we can use the memorandum of understanding uh, 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 to, to establish the uh, water level for the, is just legally not true and very clearly documented in the place. Uh, so the, then you go get to the analysis and finding of the city. The city bases their analysis and finding on the est estimated, mind you, estimated ordinary high water line by Pig's Eye Lake, which is 692.9 feet. 
So this is an estimated uh, that the city says. So they're going based on that, which is not uh, factually. But even if you were to use that arrangement, the, the picture that I put up there and the picture right here, okay, they're saying that the uh, ordinary high water level, if that were true, is six feet above the water. And they say all the work is happening below that level. I'm 6'2", I'm standing two to three feet above the water, and this hill of material that they've been bulldozing around there is 20 feet above me. So even if that were true, it's in violation of what they are saying. So they say that it, all the work is being done below that, so the city doesn't have it. The number is wrong, and the factual of what is happening on site does not match up with that. Again, it's disappointing that this is happening. I won't spend any more time on that, th that, but what I'll talk to you just as briefly as I can, the pollution issue. Um, Are these all connecting back to how the BZA aired? How, pardon me? How the, the BZA aired? I've, yes. Okay. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm and, having a difficult time tracking. And, and what it is, the Federal Registry printed June 21st, 22, there's a uh, new PF, uh, uh, PFOA uh, standards that were put out by the uh, EPA. And the EPA said in the release, people on the front lines of PFAS contamination have suffered for far too long. What, that's why EPA is taking aggressive action as part of the whole government approach to prevent these chemicals from entering the environment and to help protect concerned families from this uh, pervasive challenge EPA uh, Administrator Michael Regan. Previously, EPA had set its health advisory for PFOA and PFOS at 70 parts per trillion, but the new limits are much lower at 0 0.004 parts per trillion, uh, and for PFOS at 0 0.02 parts uh, uh, per trillion. Uh, they come, they, uh, come after the EPA last year found PFOA and PFOS to be much more toxic than previous believed in draft assessments. The EPA an uh, announced the new advisories that are 3,000 to 17,000 times lower than those released by the Obama administration in 2016. And uh, you also have the other information about the uh, impacts of the PFOA and PFOS uh, there. I will, uh, this is a- Mr. This, Diamond, you have this one- This is a letter that we received- Tom, that, you have one minute to wrap up. Okay. This is a letter we received August 4th, uh, uh, 2022, advising us that the MPCA uh, feels that 0.5%, uh, 0.5, is unsafe for uh, uh, public. They're gonna come in and install, at the cost of government or the, the program, granular uh, filters put in a house and maintained for 30 years because of the threat for cancer and other uh, 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 illnesses to the public. That's the impact that is being hauled in. It's being hauled in at a higher level than is currently there. It's the highest level of PFOS in the Mississippi River. It's the outfall of the uh, chemolite plant that is being pulled out of the river, hauled up here and dumped into our uh, aquifer. Again, this is another picture of it. It's showing the scale of what is going on. That pollution is literally killing people and it's being dumped into our aquifer and uh, in violation of the law. The state law says Mr. Th Diamond. that you cannot put any fill into the water that has any, not so, a certain level, any pollutant or nutrient in it. That's the law. All right, thank you, thank Tom. You. Thank you. Um, to my colleagues, I apologize. We have recently reduced the amount of time that we have for public hearings because our, um, we were able to put 
submit testimony, of course, online, our social media platforms, as well as the additional materials we've received from Mr. Diamond. Um, while we have established those guidelines for uh, public hearings, as well as um, some of our legislative hearing items, we have not established them for the um, Board of Zoning Appeals. So we went to 10 minutes today because we don't have that established um, and did not lay that out in the beginning. Um, for people who are <laughs> looking at me and wondering, what's our time limit? It's um, currently 10 and we can discuss that in the future. I will reiterate again though, Mr. Diamond has um, submitted significant testimony online that is available in Legistar as well as handing out these uh, packets at the table which will also be added to the public record. Thank you. Is there anyone else here to testify on this matter? Welcome. Hello. You have two minutes. Thank you. I'm Kiki Sonnen with the St. Paul Audubon Society, and uh, thanks for letting us speak for two minutes. I wanted to just uh, give a brief overview of the history of the critical area plan, the River Corridor in the city of St. Paul. Uh, Audubon's interest in it, by the way, is uh, we're on the Upper Mississippi River Flyway, which is, carries one-third and maybe even more of all the migrants that travel through the United States uh, in our area. It is also home to the Pig's Eye State Scientific and Natural Area and Sanctuary at the Pig's Eye Heron and Egret Sanctuary down at Pig's Eye. In the 1970s, Governor Wendell Anderson created a critical area plan by executive order from the city of Ramsey to Hastings, and this was later adopted in, by legislation each of the communities along the river had to develop a plan that explained the river corridor and what was going to be allowed and what wasn't, and zoning and so forth. Mayor George Latimer then established a commission to develop uh, St. Paul's plan. The con concepts included scenic vista protection, bluff land preservation, height restrictions, wildlife corridors, recreational use of river lands, and recreational use of river waters. It included environmental protections, and cleanup of pollutants. It also included methods of uh, requiring permits and applications, site plan reviews, and public hearings for when you did work in the critical area plan. For decades, St. Paul had turned its back to the river, and we are still learning that the, air, the river is the lifeblood of the city, and that the river open lands and waters clean the air we breathe and the water we rely on. Part of the critical area plan and river, co river corridor zoning is that dredge and fill permits are required to have a city plan, uh, I mean a city permit. The Corps of Engineers and Ramsey County Parks are the co-applicants in this project. They are dredging and filling in Pig's Eye Lake. They say the city's zoning code has no authority over the project because it is in a public water body. They say the DNR issued a work permit to them and that is all they need. No. Thank you. Do not give up the city's zoning authority. The public waters, as you are well know, include Como Lake, Phelan Lake, Crosby Lake, lakes throughout the city. If you'd like to see uh, dredge spoil islands in those lakes, the Corps of Engineers would only be so glad to uh, accommodate you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here to speak on this item? Seeing none, Ms. Prince moves to close the public hearing. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion prevails. Ms. Prince. And um, as I'm sure you can all appreciate just from this little snapshot we've had, um, this is a complex issue. And I'd like to lay it over for two weeks. There is no 60-day um, deadline on this. I mean, it doesn't apply in this case, so I'd like to lay it over until October 24th. All right, there's a motion for a two-week layover. Mr. Absolutely. Yep. There's some questions for staff. Yeah. For city or DNR? Thank you. Um, obviously, there's a lot of important issues that were discussed. Um, trying to just cut through some of that to determine exactly what we are looking at here is the underlying issue whether or not the issue they should have had a permit to do this work. I, that is the 
appellants believe that they should have a city permit. We staff believes that it's below the ordinary high water level and we do not have jurisdiction. Okay, so basically the, the appeal is because they believe that a permit should have been a permit should have been applied for and issued, and we believe, or the city determination and the DNR's determination is, we do not have authority to permit this, therefore we would not have issued a permit at all? Correct. There is a permit with the DNR that the project is under, but not with the city. Okay, so the DNR, there's a valid permit through the DNR. Correct. And the city's interpretation of the law and the DNR's interpretation of the law is that we don't have authority to permit, and therefore we would not be there, be able to either permit or stop a, do a stop order because we don't have the authority to permit. So that's the fact issue that we're supposed to determine here. I believe yes, that's the way I understand it. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I don't have further questions. Thank you. Any other questions? Let's find out. Other questions. I Ms. Do Yang. Have a question. Thank you. So. Can you explain if the council were to vote in support of the appeal, what would happen next? I don't know. Um, I would believe that would be, so if you're asking, let me just clarify, you're asking if you vote for the appeal, mm -hmm. stating that the city sh should issue a st stop work order. Um, I believe that would be a question for legal, not for me. Can you repeat? It would be a question for? The, the city attorneys. Okay. Thanks. On how they would advise the zoning administrator to act on behalf of the city. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, and we have two weeks to follow up on that question. Are there, is there any other um, questions that we have while um, we have staff from the DNR and the city here in the room? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. Prince has moved a two-week layover to October 19th. There's a correction in the date. I think that was proposed to the 19th. Um, any discussion? Yeah, the 19th. Yeah. There. Yep. Just for the record, the 19th <laughs> meeting on the 424th. Mm -hmm. um, the October 19th uh, layover. If there's no further discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion prevails. Six in favor, no one opposed. The item is laid over to October 19th. Item 24, resolution public hearing 22-241 ratifying the assessment for the prior avenue from University of St. Anthony paving and lighting project constructed as part of the 2022 St. Paul Streets program. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone here to speak to this item? Seeing none, Ms. Jalali moves to close the public hearing and approve. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion prevails. Six in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 25 is resolution public hearing 22-247, ratifying the assessments for benefits, costs, and expenses for the Grand Snelling park lot, parking lot operation and maintenance costs for 2023. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone here to speak to this item? All right, seeing none, Mr. Tilbert moves to close the public hearing and approve. All in favor say aye. 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 Anyone? And one and opposed. <laughs> Motion prevails. Six in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 26 is resolution public hearing 22-249, ratifying the assessment for benefits, costs, and expenses for the seventh place mall operation and maintenance costs for 2021. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone here to speak to this item? Uh, seeing none, Ms. Yang moves to close a public hearing and approve. Mm -hmm. All in favor say aye. 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 Any mm -hmm. opposed? Motion prevails. Six in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. This is a reminder that our most enthusiastic voter is out today, so we'll need some, <laughs> a little bit more, <laughs> a little more enthusiasm on the eyes. Item 27, resolution public hearing 22-291, amending the 2022 financing and spending budgets in the Department of Public Works Department, sewer utility for the private sewer connection program. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone here to speak to this item? Seeing none, Mr. Ballinger moves to close a public hearing and approve. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion prevails. Six in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. 
Item 28, Resolution Public Hearing 22-292, approving adverse action against the tobacco license held by Northern Tier Retail, LLC, doing business at Speedway, number 4023, at 50, 577 Smith Avenue. And we have a report from Ms. Garda from the City Attorney's Office. Thank you, Council President Brenlo and members of Council. This matter involves uh, adverse action against the Speedway number 4023 located at 577 Smith Avenue in the city of St. Paul. This uh, Speedway was the subject of a notice of violation after uh, it failed a youth compliance tobacco check. Um, those checks are done uh, one annually at least pursuant <clears throat> to a state statute that requires it. The underage checker went in and was actually able to buy tobacco. We sent the notice of violation out and the licensee responded on September 9th saying uh, that they wanted uh, the opportunity to um, address counsel. So it's a $500 first time majors penalty. They did admit the violation, but again, asked to address counsel. All right, great, are there any questions? All right, don't go too far away. Okay. All right, uh, this is a public hearing. Is there anyone here to speak to this item? Welcome. Hello, my name is Jesse Snodinas. I'm a district manager for Speedway. I'm sent here on behalf of the uh, tobacco violation. Um, company just wanted me to provide you guys with some actions that we took um, due to this uh, failure. Um, the, the employee in question was terminated um, per company policy, and I think that they may have attached that in some items. Um, we do have our operations policy, which is anybody that fails a sting is automatically terminated regardless of position, seniority. Um, so any sort of violation of law like that, um, automatic termination. Um, there also is uh, training both on the job and video training that they take. They get yearly refresher courses as well. And we do have an internal compliance check program called the BARS program, um, which the store has passed consistently since 2019. Um, essentially what it is is that somebody over the age of 21 that comes in but is under the age of 40, if they do not card the individual, they hand them a red card and then they are documented since the person is above the age. They're not breaking the law technically, but it's just an internal compliance check. So that's some of the actions the company has taken to prevent that and also to address the current issue. Okay, and so you're saying that these are the things you're doing to address this situation, what happened after the incident, and you're asking for a reduced fine, or what um, the, Yeah, they were looking for a reduced fine um, or anything of that nature. I was just kind of, it's not my particular area. That particular person is on vacation this week, so I was asked to come cover. Okay, great. Um, are there any questions for the, um, well, you're not really the, for the, for the, for you. Any questions? <laughs> All right, thank you very thank much. You. Anyone else here on this public hearing? Uh, Ms. Yang moves to close the public hearing. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion prevails. Um, I, my, my motion would be to go with the recommendation of the legislative hearing officer, looking to see if colleagues have um, thoughts and um, Thoughts on that motion, Ms. Yang. Thank you. Uh, I also support the recommendation too, and I do want to say thank you for coming to explain the steps that you, that you all have taken. Um, that's something that I would love to see from other businesses that have also had these same violations, and I feel that you all are setting uh, an example for what accountability can look like. So thanks for that, Ms. Jalali. I would also support the motion. I do appreciate the swift action and the signs that are meant to improve this happening again, but I also agree with the recommendation of the hearing officer. This did happen, the fine is applicable, and um, hopefully the, the actions prevent future fines needing to be issued. So I'll also vote in support of that motion. Thank you, and um, just a reminder that the council recently increased these fines. Um, for just this very reason, we want to make sure that the compliance is there, um, that the stop gaps are in place, and I do also appreciate understanding um, the swift action, but um, it would be counter 
productive for us to reduce the fines after we just raise them. So I will also be supporting my motion. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion prevails. Six in favor, no one opposed. The resolution is adopted. Item 29 is resolution public hearing 22-293, authorizing the Department of Public Works asphalt plant to amend the spending and financing budget for the professional evaluation, consultation, and redesign of the sediment pond for future operation. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone here to speak to this item? Doesn't look like it. I will encourage people if they haven't had a tour of the asphalt plan to do that. It is like a time machine. Um, and probably this sediment pond is well worth redesigning. Um, so I will move to close the public hearing and approve any discussion on the motion. Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion prevails. Six in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 30 is Resolution Public Hearing 22-294, approving the application of Twin Cities Mobile Jazz Project for a sound level variance in order to present live amplified sound on October 11th at 205 7th Street West in the rear parking lot. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone here to speak to this item? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Ballinger moves to close the public hearing and approve. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion prevails. Six in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 31 is resolution public hearing 22-298, approving the police department to accept and amend the 2022 special fund budget of the State of Minnesota Department of Public Safety Office of Justice Programs submitted for the 2022 American Rescue Plan Act Innovation and Community Safety Program Grant. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone here to speak to this item? Seeing none, Mr. Tolbert moves to close the public hearing and approve. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Six in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Item 32 is resolution public hearing 22-300, authorizing the police department to accept and amend the 2022 special fund budget for the state of Minnesota Department of Public Safety Office of Traffic Safety DWI Traffic Safety Officer Program Grant. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone here to speak to this item? Seeing none, Ms. Prince moves to close the public hearing and approve. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion prevails. Six in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. <coughs> Item 33 is resolution public hearing 22-303, amending the financing and spending plans of the Department of Parks and Recreation in the amount of $1,171,450 to reflect additional 2022 funding expected from Como Friends. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone here to speak to this item? Seeing none, Ms. Jawali moves to close the public hearing and approve. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion prevails. Six. Six yes. in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Yes, that is worth noting that is $1,171,450. It's an incredible contribution. So the thank you is in order. Oh, thank you. Um, Mr. Ballinger um, moves to reconsider item 22. 22316. I couldn't read my own writing. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion prevails. Item 34 is RLHTA 22 316, ratifying the appealed special tax assessment for property at 874 Marion Street. Ms. Marmond. Council President Brenmo and Council Members, um, this is a special tax assessment to recoup the costs for doing a cleanup at this property. The uh, cleanup uh, was ordered on April 13th of 2022 with a deadline for the work to be done by the owner by May, or excuse me, by April 21st, so a little bit more than a week. The actual recheck occurred, um, they went back twice on the 26th of March and again, April, I'm so sorry, and also on the 29th of April. So gave them a couple of chances in any case and finally the cleanup crew arrived on may 3rd so three weeks elapsed between the mail leaving the city and 
the actual cleanup crew arriving, although it was basically a one week deadline to get the yard cleaned up. The cost of the cleanup is $420 plus a service charge of $162 for a total uh, assessment of $582. In the legislative hearing, um, the property owner indicated that he did not receive the notification from the city. I would note that the notification attached to your record uh, is addressed. There's two letters that went out. One is addressed to the property owner by name and the other is addressed to the occupant. Um, he indicates neither letter arrived. However, the city has no returned mail for either of those two letters. Um, Mr. Lee also indicates that he was out of the country at the time and then he had a, a cousin looking after the house. Taking these things together, that makes the notification issue harder for me to countenance in, in context. So um, looking at the cleanup itself, I have a photograph, um, uh, if, they, if the cable office can put this up, uh, that's the photo of a part of the yard that was um, being looked at and there's also another area of the yard and with your permission i'm going to show the video of uh, the work that was done um, and it will take me just a moment to bring that up and this is the video of uh it's 74 marion work. street worker calls to dispose of tires Scattered trash, pallet, miscellaneous debris from the entire rear yard. Scattered trash. Tires, pallet. Trash. This is all to be removed. This is the work order for 874 Marion Street. This is the completion video for 874 Marion Street. Work order calls dispose of tires, scattered trash, pallet, miscellaneous debris from the entire rear yard. Rear yard along fence area, driveway, garage. Tires have been removed, pallet. Loose and scattered debris throughout rear yard by door. An entire rear yard has all been removed. So I would, um, in the conduct of the hearing, uh, Mr. Lee obviously indicated as I said earlier, that he did not receive the notice, so we discussed that. He also indicated that he has um, financial concerns in his life that make it more difficult to pay for this assessment. Uh, looking at this property, there has only been one order previously on the property, and it was to remove tall grass and weeds, and Mr. Lee did take care of that and before the crew arrived to do that. So giving credit for the previous good um, caretaking of the property. Uh, my recommendation is that you reduce the assessment basically by half from $582 to $291 and given his financial circumstances to make it payable over a period of five years. And I understand he will be looking for a further reduction in that. All right, thanks Ms. Mormond. And I would, um, just two observations. One is I appreciate the in the cleanup that uh, care was taken by the cleanup crews to retain the table, the walker, items that are clearly useful. Um, so I appreciate that. I know sometimes it's they go in, they got to do the work, and they get out of there. And when we went back to see the video, it showed a lot of care and respect. Um, I will also say that reducing the cost in half is a very generous offer. Um, the work was done. The rest of the taxpayers pay the bill if we don't. Um, charge it to the property itself. So I just want to acknowledge that it is unusual to see a reduction coming, a recommendation coming from the legislative hearing officer. So I um, appreciate the thought, you know, and the thought behind it, but also that work was done, the video is there, and we know that the bill has to get paid. So I appreciate it. It is an unusual recommendation coming yep. from me. Yep, noting, noting that such a thing. Any other questions or thoughts from Ms. Mormond? Okay. 
this is a public hearing. Welcome, thank you. If you could just introduce yourself. We know um, where the property is, so introduce yourself and share your perspective. We'll, we'll uh, put the timer on for five minutes. Um, my name is Nico Lee. Um, uh, during the time, um, the judge said they sent me a letter for the notice, but I didn't get any notice. Even my house, is, I'm sure we never missed a letter. So that main time, um, I had the cancer that time. And then cancer after cancer, and then because of the doctor, something failure, I have hernia both sides. And then after hernia, I have surgery, so many times surgery, the water back to the heart. So now I have having heart disease, and then that medication not help me a lot. So I went to the Asian, and then Thailand, I took in the treatment via traditional or herbal medicine. So that time, this, this thing is coming to me, and I told the judge, and then I like to pay, but I, there's a, my, I leave my cousin or house sitter, but he not go take care of my house, and then um, I don't say um, I have to pay, but I like to pay, but I, I don't, I can't afford that much money, because I have many, see a debt collector bill, Hospital, there is a hospital appointment, many appointments. And then I just work for the part time and then I, I can pay my house. Mortgage is not finished yet. So all those are on the selling for house process. And then my. Um, medical appear uh, also many on the way. Oh, sorry. Um, Medicare pension also, they say, I, from, from my workplace, your credit is not finished. You have to work more uh, one year or two years. So otherwise you lose your pension. So everything, as you know, depressed. Because of my, my heart, midnight. I wake up midnight and I call the doctor like this. Doctor said, oh, take it, that medicine. I take it the, the way they gave it to suit him. That did not believe me. Sometimes, you know, midnight, I was nightmare most of the night. I told the doctor, daytime, it a hard chest pain coming in daytime, I can bear that. But nighttime, after I wake up, I can go back to sleep. So that's why I knew that I have to pay all the money. But I can't afford to pay, so that's why I the question is for all just for, you know, forgiveness for me that amount money. So that is depressed to me. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? Sorry? We, so your, your request is for it to be reduced further. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ballinger moves to close the public hearing. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion prevails. Mr. Ballinger. Um, well, in lieu of the letters not coming back, and I'm, I'm sorry this is being such a hardship on Mr. Lee, but I think the offer is $191 is, is a generous one. And $291 is the generous one and to be paid over five years, I think is, I think it's fair. All right, so you move the recommendation of the legislative hearing officer. And I, I do agree with the um, $58 once a year for five years. That's, that is um, collectible on the property tax statement, I believe. That okay. would be collectible in the property tax statement. Property taxes are current. The $58 would be billed in halves, so it would come forward as two payments of $29. Okay, great. So there's a motion from Mr. Ballinger. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion prevails. Six in favor, no one opposed. The resolution is adopted. Legislative hearing consent agenda items 35 through 40 are before you for your consideration. All right, and I know that I would like to pull item 36. Um, and Ms. Mormond? 
There are no other items that I'm aware of okay. um, in the chambers. All right. Item 36, RLH OA 22-9, making recommendation to Ramsey County on the application of Jeffrey William Girton for repurchase of tax property, forfeited property at 824 Como Avenue. Council President Brenmo and council members, um, it is our practice based on uh, Ramsey County Code uh, when a tax forfeited property has been, um, when they receive an application for its repurchase from the former owner, the county sends a letter to the city saying, could you please evaluate this property and give us a determination about whether or not the property has constituted a municipal problem. We look at a time horizon of five years and look at code enforcement and basically DSI type enforcement issues as well as police issues at the property and come to a finding that's embedded in the resolution in front of you about whether or not it constitutes a municipal problem based on the review of those records and um, whether the council recommends to the county if the property should be, uh, al you know, allow for repurchase, allow for repurchase under certain conditions. Um, the council could have no opinion on the matter or to recommend that the county deny the application for repurchase based on a very bad history with uh, this particular um, property, uh, the recommendation embedded in the resolution is to allow for the property's repurchase. Um, there are some um, notable fact factors. Uh, one is that um, the review was done, um, I would say, blind of what the reason for the uh, application for repurchase was. So we, we, I don't have in the application that's in front of you the reason that was submitted by the property owner on why they needed to go through the repurchase process. That has been redacted. Uh, it is public information, but it has been redacted in the record that's in front of you. So, um, but looking at the city records without that information, um, I'm, I'm, we're giving you our best, and that's DSI and I working together, giving you our best information. All right. I appreciate that. And I, the reason I pulled this, I think, is twofold. One is just to draw my um, colleagues' attention to this and maybe to request that we get a, um, an update from Ramsey County on some changes and adjustments they've made with their, um, this tax forfeit program. Um, I think that some of the changes that they've made are about um, taking a more human approach to each of these cases as they come and making sure um, if a problem isn't a municipal nuisance, which some of them are, um, that, we're, that we work on finding methods for people to repurchase. Um, but as Ms. Mormon said, there's also some interesting missing information, like under things that say this is public information and then it's redacted and it's hard to tell what's really the story behind this story. So like kind of understanding what's going on with this program. In this case in particular, I just wanted to be clear on the record that I'm very supportive of the application or of making the recommendation to Ramsey County that um, this person is able to repurchase this property. Um, it is a property that also doubles as a business. I think it's this person's livelihood, and I have reason to believe they're struggling. Um, there is very, very slow progress on a business renovation, and so I guess if there's any way to add to the recommendation that um, unless we connect this business owner to resources and support, this is going to happen again in five years. So we need to do more than just let, allow a repurchase and fall back into the same patterns and a repurchase. Um, this is a talented and productive person that could use, running a business isn't easy. Um, so if we can provide some support as well as just, um, at, and as part of our recommendation and in addition to um, the, the approval or the, the support for a repurchase of the tax forfeited property, I would like to do that as well. So I would be in support of this, but also just wanted to raise people's awareness to the changes in this program, um, get some information about it, and also make sure that we're attaching our recommendations with our, each council board office has much more intimate relationship with the people they're in, um, and probably have um, information that could be helpful as we're making these decisions. So I would move, I would 
I guess it is a public hearing. Is there anyone here to speak to this matter besides me? <laughs> Seeing none, I would move to close the public hearing with comments um, to and, and uh, for uh, approval to recommend to Ramsey County for repurchase. Um, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion prevails. Six in favor, no one opposed. The public hearing is closed and the resolution is adopted. Okay, so this brings us to the remainder of the legislative hearing consent agenda. There's been, there's a lot of changes and adjustments. There's some that we've been working on for a long time. Um, if you are here for items 35 through 40, this is a public hearing. Anyone here to speak to this item? The items. Seeing none, Ms. Yang moves to close the public hearing and approve as amended. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion prevails. Six in favor, no one opposed. The public hearings are closed and the resolutions are adopted as amended. Okay. That is brings us to the end of a meeting that was surprisingly a bit longer than I thought it was going to be. Um, are there news from the wards? Um, just thoughts, uh, updates, events that we should know about. Ms. Yang. Thank you. I want to invite everyone to attend the Neighborhood Fall Fest and Bonfire, which is being held at this Friday, October 7th, from 6 to 7.30 p.m. at the Hayden Heights Rec Center. Um, you can join for activities. There's going to be flag football, soccer. You can uh, jump in the giant blow-up. There's a scavenger hunt. You can make some s'mores, play fun games, and keep warm by the fire and get a cup of chili for a dollar. Um, so that sounds really, really fun. I hope to make it for the first half hour. And I do want to share that the long-awaited request for offers for purchase and development of the former Hafner site is finally out. So today is the day that it, it was first launched. Um, the address is 1570 Whiteberry Avenue, and we've already gotten so many requests from developers about interest on this site, so I'm really excited to see more proposals come in for this. Our community has been waiting for this for so long. And just a bit about the RF, um, the request for uh, proposals here, um, the neighborhood vision for the area is for a mix of uses, including housing for all ages, incomes, family types, and household sizes. Commercial and mixed use proposals will be considered with a priority for offers that include affordable housing, multiple bedroom units, and active ground floor use, job creation, elements that promote environmental sustainability and space for community use. A plan, a plan for development of the full parcel is highly encouraged. Um, some of you might have seen the site already, so I'm just going to show you an image here. It's uh, this large, large, empty parcel right on Wiper <laughs> Avenue, and you will not miss it. Um, so I'm just really I'm excited to see what comes in for this, and that the deadline for it is... December 5th, 2022 at 4 p.m. And you can look on the stpaul.gov website for more information. The URL is stpaul.gov slash 1570 White Avenue. And this is a HRA-owned lot. That's great. I love when we get excited about an empty yeah. lot. <laughs> That's a great picture. Um, I said that as newsletter gold today when I saw that. It's great. Any other um, news from the order updates? Mr. Tolbert. Tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow is uh, Crosby at Crosby Park. We're having um, a community unveiling of um, final design for um, the River Learning Center. Come on by between four and six thirty. Um, I think there's a program at starting at four, but then at five there are uh, guided tours, and I heard. Boat tours. I don't know what kind of boat, but I'm enticed, and I think that <laughs> sounds pretty exciting. Um, and then also this weekend, Highland Water Tower, um, Highland Water Tower, the historic Highland Water Tower is open. Um, great, I'd say the best view of the Twin Cities by far um, to be able to check out the leaves and uh, just see different parts of the city and the surrounding suburbs of the city. Get your heart rate up walking up those steps. And you get yeah. to the top, and I know I've said this before, but you're like, oh, Highland, I get it. Because <laughs> you're up so high, you can see a lot. <laughs> but it's a really, really fun thing to do with young people because it's so, so cool from that um, viewpoint. Kind of make sure I get there. Other, new, other news? Ms. Prince? Yeah, um, MEA is coming up. Uh, the student, I mean, the teacher conference days off for families. 
and um, it's October 20, 20th and 21st. And Battle Creek, and I imagine a number of our rec centers, are offering um, activities for kids in first through fifth grade from 12.30 to 4.30 on those days. Um, at Battle Creek, the activities will include crafts, gym, games, races, and more. So you should pre-register um, by contacting, I think if you just look up, MEA Madness on our, <laughs> on, our, on our city website or Google uh, Parks and Rec, and um, you'll see what's available to help you with child care during that long weekend. Yep, it can be a lot. It can be a lot. Any other news? I have like a citywide one. It's so great. Um, I happen to be sitting next to uh, Parks Director Rodriguez on a bus in Charlotte yesterday, and he mentioned to me that um, basketball registration um, recently closed. They're still taking a few applications here and there for the city, and this is our new no-fee basketball program. Um, we have 1,257 young people signed up for basketball, no kidding. which represents a 35% increase. <sighs> Which is so great, but right? Yes. Um, I'm going to give you a, a few like real um, specific highlights that are from different places in the city. But the 10U girls and 14U girls have seen the most participation growth across the city, which is fantastic. Um, Hazel Park has two teams. Dayton's Bluff has one team for sure. And if they can get a couple more people, they may have three teams. Hayden Heights has four, possibly five teams, which is absolutely incredible for this location. McDonough has a 10U and an 18U boys team and has not had a basketball team since 2017, so this is a huge deal. Duluth and Case will have a 10U boys team and they have not had a team since 2018. Um, Edgecombe, Highland, and Northdale have six to eight teams each. And Battle Creek has 105 participants for 11 teams. Wow. Wow. It's incredible. Wow. So I wanted, I got goosebumps saying that. It's, um, what a great thing, uh, what a great thing for kids to do with their time, not only just uh, staying busy and staying out of trouble, but also uh, working on relationships and on their teamwork and, and accomplishing great things. So congratulations to our parks department. Um, this is a really, these are the kind of little things in our budget that make a huge difference for families in our community. And uh, when he said that, I was like, I'm sharing that on Wednesday. It's too yeah, good not to share. That's so beautiful. yeah, anything else? Well, if Ms. I could just add to that, my son is 37 now. But he was involved in rec center basketball when he was a kid. And so many of those friends of his from that experience are still his friends. So it's, very, it's a great way for kids to connect and have fun. 1,257 kids. That's great. So kudos. All right, let's end on a high note. There's nothing else that can be for us. We're adjourned. to you about carbon monoxide and carbon monoxide alarms. Carbon monoxide is a gas that's colorless, tasteless, odorless, and deadly. To protect your